Okay, so welcome to another Geo uh, Reddit Q and A. This is number three, and uh, I am Josh Davis, the content manager of Geo, here with Chris, um, our intrepid uh, tech guy and all around uh, a great volunteer. And um, and then also we're joined by McKinsey uh, today. Um, why don't you tell us a little about yourself, uh, McKinsey? Cool, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am a cooperative developer and pretty invested in the worker cooperative movement. And my introduction to co-ops was about 15 or 16 years ago when I moved to Ithaca, New York, which is where I still live. And I had a car that ran on waste vegetable oil. I had a diesel Jetta and uh, I found a co-op of people who were turning it into biodiesel. And I felt like it was a really radical thing, um, environmentally, economically, socially. There was a lot about that very small rural biodiesel co-op in Ithaca that I loved and kind of set me on a path of um, wanting to investigate and learn more about democratic workplaces. And since then, I've been a member of multiple worker co-ops. I'm the director of a business that's part of a co-op now. And I also have my own co-op consulting business that um, I, and through which I support lots of different kinds of co-ops along their cooperative journey. Um, and I'm one of the peer advisors of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives and really love that network and group of people. And I'm also a co-founding member of a housing cooperative that I still live in. And we've been here for about 12, 12 years or so, 11 years, I think. Um, so fairly steeped deeply in, <laughs> in co-ops. I would say, I would say, I think of the three of us, you definitely have the deepest <laughs> resume. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and yeah, of course, we're just answering questions from the r slash cooperatives uh, Reddit page. Um, and so we'll just start going through them here. Okay. Um, here we've got a question about multi-state and country worker cooperatives. Um, the Hikes and Pi says, hi all, I'm starting a small worker cooperative with three others and my deep dive on entities looks like we might have limited options based on where we're located. We have one of us in Texas, one in California, one in Oregon, and crucially one in Alberta, Canada. Because S-Corps require shareholders to be U.S. citizens or residents, we can't do that. And I can't find any information despite really searching extensively, but I think this is also true for a cooperative corporation. C-Corps do allow foreign shareholders, but I don't think that's probably what we'd want. So it looks like we'll have to register as an LLC. My question is, because there are some benefits to being a corporation as a cooperative, what are some potential ways we might be able to structure our LLC to mirror those benefits, either tax-wise or governance structure-wise or in any other ways? I saw some mention that there are potential workarounds that are less streamlined than they would be in corporations, but still functional, but I couldn't figure out what those might be. We're going to get professional counsel on this too, but if anyone has any thoughts in the meantime, it couldn't help us get prepared, um, yada, yada. So, um, McKinsey, what do you think? Great, great, great question. Great set of questions within there. Um, and yeah, definitely plus one to seeking professional counsel because um, it's kind of hard to change your entity status or your entity once it's done. So you really want to make sure you're making the right decision. That being said, I recommend to a lot of collectives and groups that want to organize cooperatively, the LLC designation is pretty um, appropriate in many cases because of, uh, it by default um, allows for members as the like the owners of the business. Um, so it's kind of like it's like a streamlined path towards the governance side of things. Um, there's a new entity, LCA, which is a limited cooperative association, I think. Um, it's not available in every state yet. And I can't say for sure if it's available in Texas, California, or Oregon, or exactly how that works with like um, foreign shareholders. Um, but that's a, just another good one to have on people's radar because it's sort of the cooperative version of an LLC. It's a little easier to get started um, and easy to organize. And I actually have heard from a lot of cooperative developers that they don't recommend S-Corps anyway. Um, 
I unfortunately can't give you like a whole lot of detail as to why, but um, I think that the, the C Corp structure is also pretty realistic. Like when we founded our housing cooperative, um, we became a C Corp in New York state. All that being said, um, when I worked in an international co-op, um, this was a co-op that was founded in New York state, grew across the nation and then grew internationally and had members in India and Slovenia. Those members were international contractors. So there's, there are sort of like two different things you want to think about. Like, how are you treating the owners and how are you treating the employees? What are those different classifications? Because they're not always, there's not always 100% overlap between employees and owners in a co-op, um, which relates to like membership. One of the principles of cooperative of a cooperative is that membership is voluntary. It's open and it's voluntary. So there will be some co-ops in which not everyone opts into membership or ownership. Um, that being said, in that international co-op, we were an S corp and could have international co-owners, but they were not employees of the business. They were contractors, they're international contractors. So that's one thing to think about is that this person who's in Alberta, Canada may not be able to be employed by the business in the United States, but they might like as a W-2 employee, because that usually requires a, you know, a social security number, a US tax ID number. They may be able to uh, be an international contractor, but still have access to ownership. Um, all um, those details. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so when you say have access to ownership, do you mean own a member share or mm -hmm. oh, in the S Corp, despite not being a U.S. citizen or resident? Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's Something it. also that like I, I think an S Corp, definitely an LLC can offer is that um, members can be individuals or other entities. So if this person in Alberta, Canada has a sole proprietorship, if they have an entity, if they create their own entity in Canada, they could theoretically, I think, as that entity, be a member of a US LLC. Um, a lot of those details I think are definitely worth checking out with professional, professional counsel um, because I'm not always as up to date on that side of things, but when it comes to the governance and structure, I think an LLC is a nice, structure it's like a it's a nice entity because as i said the default is that the the owners or the principals of the llc are considered members and so any standard llc like operating agreement template will fit nicely into a cooperative structure because it will outline how people become members how people leave membership of the LLC, uh, which is very mirroring of a lot of cooperative bylaws. Um, and an LLC will not require, like depending on what state you're in, you probably don't even have to file operating agreements. Obviously your, your co-op wants to have its own set of operating agreements, um, but it's not something that has to be like approved by the state, which may or may not be beneficial, especially if you're starting a co-op on a bootstrap budget um, an LLC is, a, is you know, it, it's a low cost to file. Um, you can state who all the members are and then on your own create the operating agreements. Um, and they can be whatever you want, really. Like the operating agreements of an LLC can be whatever the LLC wants it to be, whatever all of the members agree to. And so that's often why a lot of new co-ops or non-incorporated collectives will go the LLC route when they do finally incorporate because it's um, a smooth transition. Um, and another thing I'll say is that, um, well, there are different tax implications for different types of businesses when it comes to how the business functions, how the co-op functions. Um, any group of people can agree to function cooperatively together, um, regardless of their entity type. I think Sometimes people get a little bit overwhelmed or like backed into a corner at the entity choice, um, which is just the beginning of things. Um, and so I try to encourage people to not get too stuck there and to know that um, 
they can operate how they choose. They can have their own set of bylaws, whether or not the attorney general of the state wants to see them. They can have their own bylaws. They can have their own operating agreements around how they'll uh, function cooperatively. Yeah, and um, from my experience with uh, some some guys who set up a worker co-op, um, and yeah, you, you know that the, that they went with the LLC form for a, a couple of reasons. Um, one, because it was just the easiest in terms of paperwork, like in the moment, you know, to mm -hmm. do that. Um, two, it meant that they didn't have to worry about things like minimum wage and worker comp, workers comp because they were all, you know, owners of the business. Um, and they never had any just employees. So mm -hmm. um, it, you know, and then there were, you know, it turned out like the taxes, like, you know, ended up being a little bit confusing for everybody with their, their f something for K, something with a K. I don't remember the number, maybe you're, uh, you know, probably uh, more familiar, but um but yeah, it, it, you know, the taxes seem like it was a little bit more. Everybody was kind of on their own, whereas I, you know, think if you right. had like more of the, you know, the corporate structure of one variety or another, that's it's kind of a little more baked in, uh, like with your tax withholdings right. and stuff. Right. Yeah, and and an owner business to do right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, an owner of a business is going to receive like a K one or a K two, something like that, that's saying true. like. I own this business. This business was profitable to this degree or not in the past year. Um, and you file that with your personal income taxes, which is different than if you're in a C corp or an S corp maybe, and you're an owner of the business and also an employee of the business. So if you're an employee, you're going to get a W-2 and you'll file your taxes that way. And you'll also get, if you've received patronage, you'll receive um, like a patronage dividend tax form also to complete. So um, yeah, it kind of like, I think any, all co-ops should have uh, like bookkeeping or accounting support, you know, whether it's internal or outsourced, it's, you're going to pay taxes as an individual on money that you make. The business is going to pay taxes. If you're an owner, you're entitled to profit sharing, you know, like a lot of those things are standard. It's just kind of like how it shakes out. So um yeah, being an owner, being like a member owner of an LLC is simpler in some ways because you don't have employees. You don't have to worry about employment law quite as specifically. Um, but then, yeah, each individual member owner of an LLC is going to have to file separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, just one other thing I would add from my experience with the LLC model is that I'd say it's very important in your operating agreements and in your other like official like business documentation to be very clear about how the ownership of the business is divided between the members because in a typical LLC, typical traditional business, that ownership is like percentage basis on the amount based on how much money you put in generally, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in this, you know, my example, there were people putting in anywhere from $1,500 to $8,000. Mm -hmm. And, but they had decided that, you know, it's one member, one vote and the business is, you know, an, an entity that we're all, we all own equally. We all have an mm -hmm. equal share in. Mm -hmm. And that one was kind of a difficult thing for people to wrap their heads around and get on board right. with. But right. even after they did, it was still, it was very difficult to explain to other people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what mm -hmm. that was. And mm -hmm. especially had to go talk to a lawyer and stuff like that. So um, just, yeah. you know, something to keep in mind that, you know, the depending on how you structure, uh, you, you know, your co-op, um, you know, you you, you want to make it really clear in the documentation and how like your um, the individual members capital accounts. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, because these guys were starting off and for the first couple of years, not paying themselves, but tracking their labor right. and putting that into like people's, you know, accounts with no, no real mon money value on it, but still kind of right. like we want to account for this at some point. Mm -hmm. And that all got to be very sticky because we didn't know and they didn't know and I didn't know. And, and I mean, in advance to like the amount of detail that we really should have gone into, they should have gone into beforehand mm -hmm. to say, okay, this is how we're valuing labor. This is, you know, mm -hmm. when it's going to be paid off. If you put in more hours 
but somebody else has put in more money, does that mean right. that they have, you know, a, they own more of the, um, you know, uh, the, the, the stuff, you know, the, the, the capital investment, mm -hmm. you know, right. that we put in, that became a conversation. I put in more hours this month and then out of this, re this month's revenue, we bought this capital thing, you know, we mm -hmm. bought this fermenting vessel. Does that mean I owned, I, shouldn't I own more of that fermenting vessel than other people since I put in more work? So yeah. these kind of questions yeah. come up. And it's not clear, and we do things very different than the traditional kind of business structure. So, mm -hmm. I think it's just, I'm, you know, just really encourage people to really think it through and and get put it all in writing and make sure you're all on the same page before you rush into buying stuff together. And, and Absolutely, yeah. We we live in a society in which capital is king, and so if you've contributed capital, then that means that you own some relative share. And so I think that's. That first and foremost is a hard thing for people to wrap their minds around, especially founders who are putting in tons and tons of capital or tons of sweat equity labor. Um, I think there are kind of two different tracks that have to be like managed really well from the beginning. And as, as you're saying, like being very, very clear about, okay, if I put this much money or labor, because we can equate labor to money in certain ways, right? Like let's, let's be clear about how we're equating money and labor. And let's be really clear about like how, how what I put in will come back to me. Like, am I making an investment in this business? Are founders going to receive a bonus? That's how some co-ops do it. Um, but no matter what, no matter how much capital you put in in a co-op, you've got to have it kind of written in stone that if you're going to be a truly democratic organization, then the investment of capital does not purchase more dem you know, voting power or decision-making rights. Um, so someone could put in a bunch of time that's unpaid. Someone could put in a bunch of money and someone could put in nothing. And in theory, they're all coming together, agreeing, we're going to make these decisions together separately. You know, we're going to pay back the person who put in a bunch of unpaid labor and we're going to pay back the person who put in a bunch of money. Um, those are kind of two separate tracks. I think it's a little bit difficult, but really necessary to separate the decision making from from capital investment and how people are paid through their like patronage or capital accounts. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and, and just one last thing on this, I'd say always imagine the worst case scenario <laughs> and that you are ending up in front of a judge who's going to have to like make a determination based on the things that are written on the pieces of paper that you give him. Right. And just, right. even though we all hope and pray that that never happens, that like do that. And if it does happen, you'll be, thankful that you did that you put in that yeah <laughs> that yeah way. hope for the best prepare for the worst <laughs> and um in oh, case in case nobody's seen it um i have here an example of the illinois uh limited worker cooperative association act um i don't think texas has one i know they mentioned a few different states i don't think texas has one yeah. i'm in texas right now um but i i asked key asked some of the uh worker co-ops in texas how they did it how they incorporated it. and um key figures co-op out of austin got back to me and they also shared their bylaws and they said that they used um there's a texas business um texas business organizations called chapter 251 cooperative associations that's the law that they follow for how to incorporate um their worker co-op um but it's cool they also sent me their bylaws too um so, like, shout out Key Figures for doing that. <laughs> key Figures um, is great. That's all I got. They are an accounting co-op, is that right? Or like a bookkeeping co-op? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, so they're great. They're a great resource for running some ideas by. <laughs> yeah, and they also. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I hand it back to you, Josh. Yeah, I think uh, we probably answered that that question as thoroughly as uh, as anybody could hope for so we'll move on to the next one here um we've got chain shapers oh and i was excited to see this this um uh, this is a this is a this is a guy that we should get in contact with as chain shapers um when i was doing research about the 1970s boom in natural food co-ops in minnesota for my film the co-op wars i was struck by the tension between the co-ops as counterculture social clubs versus businesses uh, 
They literally wouldn't exist without the social ties and cultural commonalities that made them work as social spaces, but they became alienating if potential customers saw them as exclusive clubs for young hippies. To survive and thrive, they had to become more professionalized, but many older people miss their social aspect, as some young people crave a similar experience. In the same vein, I found that some of the early black co-ops in Minnesota were started as social clubs in an era when racial discrimination limited black people's ability to rent social halls. Does anyone have thoughts about how co-ops can be built on existing social scenes these days? This is a great question, and I would love to watch the co-op wars. Um, looks like a really interesting premise. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, yeah, I've, I, I've seen it and it's, uh, oh. there was some crazy stuff going down between like feuding groups of people trying to control these different food co-ops that had all like sprung up in the seventies. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty wild. Definitely worth looking up and watching. Yeah. Well, I have a kind of a lot of thoughts coming in and I'll try to articulate. And I think it's important um, for me to see that co-ops are inherently counterculture until maybe someday they won't be, but they just are today. Um, co-ops are um, uh, people, I think, like organize themselves in collective cooperative ways, but I think co-ops as businesses, right? They, they are both at the same time, they are counterculture businesses. Um, and so, um, and they're often very grassroots. A lot of times they start as grassroots organizations um, that want to formalize themselves. But nowadays we see a lot more co-ops springing up from like very established businesses that are transitioning to worker ownership when an, um, an owner is retiring. So there are like a lot of different social things at play for sure. There's sort of like the social network within the co-op itself, which is its own um community, its own culture, I'd say, like each co-op has its own culture. And then there's like community of the industry and the culture of the industry that the co-op is in. And then there's like the, the culture of the, of cooperatives broadly, the culture of the ecosystem or the co-op movement. Um, and yeah, I, I've experienced this and I, I've, I've been in co-ops that are like, you know, I, I see my work in cooperativism as like, uh, kind of inherently very radical. I identify as an anti-capitalist. I think that we have to build a different kind of economy that's not based upon, um, you know, ownership of a few or like decision-making rights being tied to capital, as I mentioned before. Um, but not everyone in co-ops feels that way. Um, some people in co-ops just kind of like the idea of making decisions together. Some people end up working at a co-op because they have a skill that's needed by the co-op and they might be very unfamiliar to cooperatives and maybe not really that invested in building the solidarity economy. I think that cooperators like exist in us on a spectrum for sure when it comes to like their, how, how they view their co-op as either political or not political or social or not social or uh, professional or grassroots. Um, I think something that um, something that I think a lot about when we're talking about how do you know, how do we have thoughts about what are what are the thoughts about how co-ops can be built on existing social scenes? Um, coming out of the disability community is the statement: nothing about us without us. Don't design anything for you know blind people. Don't design things for deaf people. Don't design things for people with mobility issues without having blind people, deaf people, people with mobility issues at the table designing. And I think that that's like kind of a key component here, even though I recognize that we're not talking about the disability community. I just think that that's great. Like, um, I like to interpret that a little bit broadly. And if we're trying to build co-ops off of existing social scenes, well, who's the we, I guess, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, I would say it's those, it's those social scenes. If those social scenes are functioning cooperatively, um, if those, if, if there are certain like cohorts of people, if there are grassroots organizations or communities that could benefit from the cooperative structure, then I think we can, we as cooperative developers, we as people invested in the movement can support them in doing so. I don't know that it's really like up to 
anyone outside of those social scenes to mm-hmm. determine how co-ops do or do not build upon their foundation. Yeah. 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 I mean, so a number of thoughts on that, um, I, I, on what you said. The first one, though, I'm got, I want to push back a little bit on your statement that um, all co-ops are inherently countercultural. Now, I want to push yep. back with, your, with just three letters. R E I. <laughs> well, and R E I so, as a yeah. consumer co-op, I, I I see consumer co-ops as less inherently radical and political than work. I mean, we can also look at Cinex, uh, mm-hmm. uh, or you know, car, you know, a lot of the producer co-ops that energy energy co-ops for sure. I, right. I I'm you know so, I'm pretty I'm pretty deep in the worker <laughs> co-op movement, and I'm. Right. And I'm definitely so on the clear, far I mean, end. Because, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, on yeah, the yeah. I'm on one end of that spectrum and how I yeah. view what I think the worker purpose co-ops. of worker co-ops. I would agree with is. you that worker co-ops, I think, are are kind of inherently countercultural. Although it's even possible for worker co-ops um, in certain situations to to lose that, right? We, sure. um, but but that's not anyway. That's not what we're talking about. I'm just uh, you know. I'm I'm the reply guy saying well, but but actually, um, <laughs> well, yeah, and we can, I think it's important to know which like bubbles we're living in because right. yeah, bubbles yeah. are much much bigger than, but than I any, you know, my experience. But but you said exactly what I was thinking about. You know his his question here: How can we you know uh, co ops be built on existing social scenes? One is like, well, you go to those social scenes and you say. Hey, you know, if you're interested in doing something co-op, like I can, like I know about co-ops and it seems like that's kind of the, you know, that'd be your guys' vibe. Um, the other thing I would say is a lot of the social scenes, if you like learn about them and become involved in them, what you find is they already are doing cooperative stuff, even if they don't call it that. Like you were saying, you know, in the first question, it's not about the structure, it's about the culture and mm-hmm. and how you're working together. Um, and so for one example, I'll throw out there, because I'm a child of the 90s. I grew up going to the arcades and watching uh, other kids, uh, play uh, fighting games and then putting my quarter up and then, you know, getting my butt kicked in like, you know, 25 <laughs> seconds. And I'm like, done. And I'll just watch you guys uh, play. And so that turned into a big scene. And there's this, the fighting game community, they call it, the FGC. Mm-hmm. And um, the cooperative ethos is explicit um, in like just how the scene grew up from just people who were, you know, like these competitive games, like to play against each other, started, you know, having tournaments um, that just like, you know, at that point, like it was a lot of like high school kids just like getting together and like, hey, let's put together some money and so we can, you know, rent some space and have a tournament mm-hmm. for this game and see who's really the best or whatever. And, um, and it, you know, blows up. It just c- has been, you know, growing since the, you know, 90s and the early 2000s to where, you know, they're, massive uh, tournaments now with massive mm-hmm. prize pools, but even the big ones, like one of the biggest ones is uh, CEO, which stands for Community Effort Orlando. It's a big cool. fighting game tournament in Orlando and it's called Community Effort because that, you know, the, the community of all the people who, you know, enjoyed yeah. this pastime came together and, and did it. And it's like, there's a ton of co-op kind of ethos already baked in there. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of it isn't really necessarily building co-ops on social scenes, but learning to see co-ops in the social, you know, the cooperation that's Uh already there. And then also, you know, you know, involving yourself in the scene, you know, if you're into that and, uh, and then, you know, when you're part of it, you'll see where, you know, maybe Uh a co-op can fit in here and Uh work with the people. And I do think that this, this tension of like, you know, we need the grassroots culture to like build cooperatives but also if the co-op is going to exist as a business, it has to appeal to something a little bit more palatable. That's a real tension. Change Shapers is right about that. It's a tension that I have felt in co-ops and with co-ops. I, I experience it in my housing co-op. Um, it's, it's, I don't have any like quick answer for it other than to, you know, just try to motivate folks to find balance and to let the people who really want to, add professionalism to a co-op to like do it with a skill set that is uh, needed, but respectful of the culture and for the culture to be accepting of ways that they could evolve or grow or shift a little bit. I think it's really hard for underground scenes to start to pop their heads up a little bit and have to like start talking about taxes. 
Um, I get that a lot of that stuff isn't fun, but, um, but that balance I think is what leads to a group or a co-op being a little bit more sustainable, not burning out, not getting stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, did you have any thoughts on this? Um, no, I was just honestly just thinking about like, what would lead me to ask this question? And it just mm -hmm. kept resonating with the responses that, that Mackenzie gave at first, which is, um, yeah, make sure you're not coming in as an outsider trying to change people, you know, like, <laughs> um, yeah. who, <clears throat> you know, against their consents and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Don't be the Steve Buscemi meme, right? <laughs> like, hello, fellow kids. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, um, yeah. So on that, you know, kind of the, the first part of his question, um, about you know how a, a co-op can start out as kind of a social scene and then gets professionalized and 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 kind of the social scene aspect can maybe alienate some people mm -hmm. and that can be an issue and so i mean my kind of answer to that is well maybe the solution is we just need more co-ops like it's fine that you have your co-ops for that's just a club for young hippies but also mm -hmm. have the co-ops that are the club for like you know old church sure. ladies yeah, whatever you know like yeah you know. <laughs> there's there's room for all those styles for sure mm -hmm. and um Another thing that I'm thinking about is that, like, I, I often see the, you know, I think people in co-ops talk about, like, the mission of co-ops generally is to provide value to their members. And in worker co-ops, it's to provide dignified employment to their workers, that sort of thing. So in a consumer co-op, like a grocery store, I would think the, the mission of that co-op is to provide value to the consumers. So that might mean that a co-op is a really awesome buying club for a bunch of people who get discounts on their whole grains, but as a group, maybe they don't care that much about profit, right? Like they just, I, I think that that like to think about what the goal of the group is and what the mission of the co-op would be and would becoming a co-op serve the members of that group? Awesome, how? Let's make it happen. But if not, if formalizing a social group or like a cultural scene into a cooperative doesn't have any like obvious value add to the members, then it might not be the right approach. I mean, I love to slap my co-op sticker on most businesses, but like sometimes it's just not gonna happen. It does, you know, it's not necessarily the answer to everything. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Uh, the, uh, oh, so, okay. It's like, I had a thought, I'm grasping for it. Here it is. Um, membership over time changes. And this is something I've seen in a lot of co-ops that I've visited and, and, uh, and, and um, even been a part of uh, to some extent. But, but really in like, you know, co-ops that have been around say as long as I've been alive, um, you know, the people who started the co-op, because we have, you know, open voluntary membership, um, you end up with uh, different, um, you know, different members over time who have different goals and are there for different reasons. So maybe the first, the, the founders may have, you know, it might be about buying food together and also socializing, right? And then other people get involved because, hey, they here's how you can get cheap food and they're not so interested mm -hmm. in the socializing. And then maybe over time, it's the majority of people are there for the cheap food and not so much the socializing and that's right. seems to be getting in the way. And then like, you know, this, you know, kind of thing like he's talking about, it gets professionalized, it changes. And maybe that's that's fine. And the people who want to do the socializing, okay, it, it, you know, you break off and you go start the next co-op, right? And we kind of seed, you know, uh, things mm -hmm. like this. Like it's not, you know, I don't think it, um, it's fine, I think, for things to change and grow over time, just like right. anything does in nature. You know, you start out with a little um, seed and, you know, 10 years later, it's a big tree and you don't, you know, complain that it looks different or it serves a different purpose right. now, right? Right. And economic value and social value are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. So oh, there sure. can be the professionalization of a social group into a cooperative business that also is able to maintain like the social nature of it. So, I mean, I get, I totally get the nature of the question and I would be curious uh, to know if there are some like real time examples that this person is is thinking of um because it is a, an interesting thought experiment all right 
On to the next one. Hosting suggestions for an e-commerce co-op. Uh, Aries Sandwich Lover. Um, I, I'm also a sandwich lover, so I love that <laughs> name. Uh, hello, I'm part of a cooperative that is getting ready to launch our platform, which includes a WooCommerce powered marketplace. We are trying to find a VPS, virtual private server, hosting provider that will allow us to scale up our VPS as we grow and that is also aligned with our principles. We're especially concerned about the genocide that is taking place in Palestine, so we want to stay away from Intel processors and limit our involvement with companies that contribute to the Israeli economy as much as possible. Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Cool. Do we have Great. any suggestions? <laughs> yeah, well, so... Um before I was where I am now, I was the member of a tech co-op for five and a half years. And that tech co-op was pretty invested in um, developing a lot of open source, commons, data type software. Um, we used WooCommerce also. Um, and so I would recommend reaching out to CoLab Cooperative. That's an international co-op that I mentioned before. They do uh, that tech stuff. There's actually like a really great... Um, group of international tech co-ops that are doing this exact work, building their own servers. Colab was working on building their own servers when I was there. Um, so that's my number one recommendation, I guess. It's hard. I don't, I'm not like quite as involved in the tech world anymore. It's been a few years. And so I'm, I can't say that I'm totally up to date, but um, if someone were to reach out to Colab, C-O-L-A-B dot co-op, I think they would probably get some good help and tell them that Mackenzie sent you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't think I can do better than that other than just to add, there are also lots of other tech co-ops um, uh, yeah. who share your uh, concerns um, and your values. Uh, so just I'll, I'll throw out a couple that, and I don't, I'm not telling you that if you send them an email asking this question, you'll get a response, but I can tell you that they're tech co-op people, they're cooperators and they, they share all these values and I wouldn't be surprised at all if they did. And they won't mind me saying, if you get in contact with Agaric Cooperative, you Absolutely. know, I'd buy them or Autonomic, um, who just set us up with our, our email, got us off of MailChimp. Um, Sassafras. Sassafras, another um, good one. C4, so, C4 is in New Orleans. There we go. So yeah, um, reach out to the tech co-op people, right? And bigger and like tech co-op networks like Zebra Unite. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. And any one of those co-ops, I think, would help you find a way into yes. other tech co-ops. There is also a tech co-ops listserv you can get on. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an NPO list, uh, list I think. Um, but anyway, yes, all of those. And Aries Sandwich Lover, if you're part of a tech co-op already, then maybe you are members of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives or could become so. And there is a tech peer network that's part of that, the Federation. And that is a rich and lively group of people. They meet regularly and solve these exact problems. There you go. All right. I like it. We start off with a little <laughs> answer and, and end up with a big one. So, right. um, okay. This was the, so this is from the beginner thread. One of the things we do, um, I'm a mod on this, uh, the subreddit, by the way, and one of the things we decided to do was include this beginner question thread uh, every month. Um, so, whoops, let me see, I, I answered this one in text. We've kind of already gone over it, but this guy says, how do, um, this is photograph, photograph odd eight. How do we decide what legal structure to use to start a cooperative versus other models like steward ownership? I've heard it's easier to just be an LLC first and then convert to a co-op later. Yeah, we talked about this at the beginning, and I will clarify that I'm not suggesting that people form an LLC and convert to a co-op later. I'm saying if folks form an LLC, that is a great structure through which to function cooperatively. Um, converting entity types, I think, is a little bit cumbersome, no matter how you chic it. <laughs> That's what I told them. Yeah, it's like I, I have not heard that it's easy to convert entity types. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but depending on what state you're in, you're, you know, there might be a co-op statute that's a little bit easier to navigate than others. And like I said, the, the LCA designation is becoming something that's more available in more states. What did I do? Um, so what steward ownership, do you know? I'm what, not are familiar. you familiar with that term? I'm not. Yeah. Other models like steward. I mean, that makes me think more about like a land trust Um 
I wonder if it comes from that mm. type of cooperative mm. ownership, but I can't mm -hmm. really speak to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Next up, we have Glassy Classy 77 says, does anyone know how the distribution of net surplus works? One of my instructors assigned me a report on the distribution of net surplus. Does the distribution of net surplus have a formula or computation? My instructor mentioned that it involves calculations. Can anyone help me? Yeah, your instructor is right. It involves calculations, formulas, computations. Um, most uh, don't I mean doesn't your bookkeeping software do most of the calculations for you at this point isn't quick oh it or, could yeah I mean as far as the formulas go I don't think we're, we're not talking about like writing things out on a on a book but right. but to, but feeding the formula into a software is important and should reflect like the bylaws and I know that a lot the way that a lot of co-ops do it because I think this is less a question of like how do I physically or practically do it but more like what is the process um, the way that a lot of co-ops will do it is, you know, end of year comes around and it usually takes a few months to reconcile the books from the previous year and all expenses are paid and taxes are paid. And we know like, here's our actual profit. This is the money that was extra left over and the board of directors, which is uh, a representative board elected by members and comprised of members will determine, okay, we have a hundred thousand dollars in surplus. And maybe our bylaws say that we get to decide what to do with it. Or maybe our bylaws say that 50% of that goes back into the business in savings or something. And the other 50% of it gets divided equally among our owners. Or maybe 100% of it gets divided among all owners based upon their hours worked. So it's proportional, like profit is proportional. There are different ways to distribute net surplus, but there's always some process of, first of all, obviously determining what the surplus is, and then the board of directors or some like representative elected, ideally membership body determining, following the bylaws, of course, and in conjunction with that, determining the split of the surplus that goes to the business versus to the members, and then some way of determining, is it that all members get an equal share or is it that members get a share based on how much they worked? Um, and also like within that, sometimes a co -op, like the board will decide, okay, so 50% goes to the business, 50% goes to the members. Of that 50% that goes to the members, 50% of that is paid out to them over the course of five years into their internal capital account. And 25% of it is given as a bonus and 25% of it is um, distributed through paychecks for the rest of the year. You know, there, there are definitely, there's room for creativity, I guess I'd say, and like how a co-op foresees wanting to like use their surplus, but um, definitely there are formulas and calculations involved yep. and there's, and it's got, it's something that's got to be kind of like set ahead of time, even if it's just like 100% of surplus is equally distributed among our members have that in writing um right or i mean you know often i guess the what i would be more familiar with is kind of on the basis of hours and that's a question that's come up uh, again and you know in some worker co-ops is okay so if we have different pay rates for different jobs that we're doing mm -hmm. right when at the end of the year if we have surplus to distribute and we just you know uh, person A who who did the higher paid job, you know, they, they put in, you know, a thousand hours this year and person B who had a lower paid job also put in a thousand hours this year. When we distribute the surplus, does it go half and half because it, it, both people worked half hours or does it get more to the person who got, does the higher paid job, mm -hmm. right? Like those kind of questions. I think it's on a, I mean, personally, my preference is for an hourly basis and I'm not even a huge fan of having big wage differentials um, right, right. at all. But, um, but yeah, I, that's. Yeah. I have seen it in co-ops where it's based on an hourly structure, but not on the rate. So mm -hmm. let's say the three of us are members in a co-op and we've worked, you know, 500, a thousand, 2000 hours, and we all make different rates. We would calculate the total of all of the hours we've worked is 4,000. And then we get like, 
our representative piece of that um, from the patronage, not based on our wage, but rather based on the time put in. Um, because usually like uh, wage differences and co-ops are great because, you know, compared to like a standard U.S. corporation where the pay ratio from highest to lowest paid is up to 450 in co-ops, the average year over year tends to be two to one. No, most people in a co-op aren't making more than twice than the lowest paid worker in a co-op. Um, you know, those like different hourly rates, different wages, different salaries reasonably can reflect things like tenure at the co-op or skills that you're bringing or education. And while I have a lot of admiration and respect for co-ops that are committed to paying everyone the same salary or the same rate, I don't personally feel that that's necessary. I think that differences in salaries or wages can reflect what people are bringing, but the time itself, like the, the way that patronage, patronage to me reflects something different than those skills or something different mm -hmm. than tenure at the co-op. And instead what it represents is my soul, you know, me as an individual and my ownership stake in this co-op. And that is not worth more or less than your ownership stake in the co-op or your ownership stake in the co-op. And so um, that's Excellent. just one yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and to be clear, um, I'm not saying that I've ever come across a co-op that actually distributed their surplus like that, but it is a mm -hmm. conversation that I've had to mm -hmm. have, you know, with people and it has gotten like testy. So, um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, you know, the, the, yeah, the general rule is patronage is, is, uh, you know, just a percentage, you know, of hours work. Um, mm -hmm. Another point I wanted to add here though, uh, that a lot of uh, the co-op people that I uh, am in contact with worker co-op people, and even um, a guy from the USDA, who recently sent us an article that we'll be uh, publishing in a little bit um, is really into the idea of indivisible funds, right? Mm -hmm. And so taking part of the net surplus, putting it into a fund that does not get distributed to the, the members will never be distributed to the members mm -hmm. is to be used for either, you know, growing the co-op ecosystem or mm -hmm. supporting exactly. some social justice or ecological, you know, thing that you're into or, yeah. um, or otherwise to be used like to support your commitment to uh, to the community and it does a couple of things um one you know it, it it makes sure that you're actually embodying that seventh principle and then it also um takes away some of the impetus for demutualization you know because mm -hmm. at least a portion of your you know, it, it's like a portion of your profits, even if you broke it up, whatever's in the indivisible fund would still just, you know, ideally you write it into your bylaws that even if the co-op dissolves, the indivisible fund has to be like donated to a nonprofit something. or something. Right. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's great. So, all right. Um, if Chris doesn't Wait. unmute himself. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, can we slide over to talking about Mackenzie's co-op? our co-ops oh do you want to spend some time just talking about mckinsey's co-ops i'm I, I mean i'm happy to do that but i think we have enough time for one more question maybe if, if okay we so we've to. got looking for materials on consumer co-ops uh know about any stage or lighting design co-ops or fashion co-op these are specific co-ops huh um Stage and lighting design and tech co-ops and fashion co-ops. What was the first one? Consumer co-ops? Materials on consumer cooperatives. So um, considering starting mm -hmm. a consumer cooperative, looking for a startup manual. Um, any good ones in particular that you know of mm -hmm. for consumer co-ops? Um, I'm a little less versed in like the startup 101 space of consumer co-ops. I would be curious to learn lay stitcher, what type of co-op um is is mm -hmm. in the works and if it's like um a material heavy or like an you know like is it like an equipment based co-op is it one that requires a lot of um like startup inventory or is it like a maker co-op is it a producer co-op is it an right. agricultural co-op those things will kind of change and i do think that there are probably good resources out there especially among the like producer and ag co-op space USDA, of course, being a good mm -hmm. resource for anyone who's making or growing. Um, looks like there are already some good answers, which is nice. 
Yeah, somebody's asking them again, like what kind of co-op panel like you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a food co-op, the neighboring food cooperative association uh, is a good group to hit up for educational materials. They're very, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I would think even, you know, maybe if you're not doing a food co-op, but something that might, you know, have some similarities to it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, taking a look at their stuff uh, would probably be good. Um, and yeah, he has a bunch of, you know, links to other Reddit threads, uh, Consumer Federation of America, um, who I actually, in a former life, did lobbying for in Washington, D.C. for two days. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They apparently have a guide that's probably mm -hmm. good. And CDI, Cooperative Development Institute. Uh, CDI co and, and Start.coop are both great resources, although I think yep. a little bit more focused on worker cooperatives. Yep. Um, yep. Start.coop is a worker co-op incubator. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. But yes, uh, CD, CDI, and I mean, yeah, it's a so bit broad, more broad. I think. One one resource that I would suggest for this person is that mm -hmm. every state has a land grant university from like the USDA or something like that. And uh, in in New York, where I am, it's Cornell University. There's a public and a private portion. The public portion of Cornell is the land grant university. I did my undergrad at Penn State. That's the land grant university in Pennsylvania. Each state has a university that is specifically tied with um, the government so that it can provide cooperative extension resources. So I don't know exactly where this person is located, but if they're in the US, I would recommend that they look into what their like local or state cooperative extension looks like because those are the, the goal of a cooperative extension at a land grant university is very specifically to to bridge the gap between research and teaching and the community. And um, Cooperative Extension lives in between and they provide tons of education, they provide funding, and I bet they would have resources on consumer cooperative startup. I bet, I can't say that for sure, but I know mm -hmm. that the Co-op Extension in Ithaca is um, yeah. a great resource, so. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do a do a web search for your state name plus co-op development center, you know, and you're likely to find something useful. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So I guess uh, that'll do it for our Reddit Q and A number three. I just wanted to. I'm glad that we're able to have an opportunity uh, to talk to Mackenzie about the co-ops that they're involved in, and you know, thanks Mackenzie for helping us out with the with the Q and A. Yeah, um, I hope I hope it was helpful. Um, definitely was <laughs> <laughs> very helpful. And if, that was and great. If, Much less BSing if, than normal. <laughs> <laughs> if folks want to reach out with me, any anybody who asks those questions, if they want to continue the conversation, or if anyone hears anything that interests them, or um, something that they want to push back on, I'm, I'm really happy to for folks to reach out to me. I love talking about co-ops. So great.